Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Mindgasms podcast. I'm going to talk to Shane Kennedy again today. He wanted to talk to me because of my my last video that I made that pissed a lot of people off called Jordan Peterson's Postmodern Neo-Marxist Boogeyman Doesn't Exist. So we're going to... I. Uh, we were we wanted to um, have kind of more of a, a nuanced and hopefully not antagonistic conversation because I've had too many of those lately about postmodernism and Jordan Peterson and the broader cultural context. So in terms of topics like culture and mythology and history and politics and this kind of uh, excess and focus on social justice that I think I was mentioning to you earlier, Shane, that uh, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff focus on in their new book, The Coddling of the American Mind, and I'm a huge fan of Jonathan Haidt. So, yeah, anything, anywhere you want to start, we can start there and then kind of look at, at all of these issues, hopefully, in the broader cultural context. Um, yeah, I mean... Uh, it's been interesting to see that there's a wide variety of responses to it, right? Like the way that Haidt would approach it with the colony of the American mind, he tends to usually focus on his three, uh, three, what does he call them? The three wrong assumptions or anti-truths or what are they? Oh yeah. The, the three untruths, the three great untruths, I think is what he calls them. Yeah. And that's a very, very height way to approach something because you pick, uh, you pick three uh, very definite things you have evidence for three you know uh very defensible uh propositions and you kind of go at it that way and and the reason it's brought up that because there's there's many different ways you can kind of uh diagnose the situation so what uh what what aspect of, of, of it for you do you find most perplexing or most interesting or do you think you have the best take on is there a particular angle of it where something really resonates with you in terms of this this recent phenomenon where it seems like there's a, a new set of ideologies that kind of seem to be running the show in a lot of different spaces um idea well, sets. well i i think like like i i would say i i basically like the way that that jonathan height kinds of kind of puts it the most um you know that basically people are co people are concerned with uh but people are concerned with the same issues, but they look at them from different perspectives based on their their different psychological and moral values. So, like the like the way that Jonathan Haidt explains it in the in the coddling of the American mind, and then also in uh, in the righteous mind as well, is that like these. These people, the these people on campuses who are really focused on social justice, they have, they have. It's for the most part, it's that these people have good intentions and they have good goals. They want to achieve things that most people can agree are good goals, like equality and people being treated fairly and stuff like that. But it gets excessive, especially when you look at like how um, like parenting is one of the factors that Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff talk about how this kind of like overprotective parenting can lead to children being like more entitled and uh, maturing more slowly than they used to. So they think they, they can do things like demand that professors not talk about particular subjects because talking about having particular opinions about particular subjects, particular types of speech are physically harmful to them, which yeah. I think is uh, an excessive and inaccurate explanation of that. To say the least, to say the least. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, do you, do you buy into the, the research where if you do like a moral foundations theory, uh, all of the five moral taste buds of height, you can actually see some sort of uh, like the people who fall in these classes tend to have certain moral dispositions, right? Yeah. And, uh, Peterson, when he first came onto the scene, um, he had a master's student who hasn't picked up the research, but uh, he was talking about how when you look at uh, the authoritarian left versus, let's say, um, a center left kind of characteristic as kind of rough approximations, right? 
Um, there's actually like personality types that kind of fall into that. So authoritarians tend to be lower in openness usually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, for, for example, right? So when I, one thing that I, I look at is when I look at these things is, you know, on the one hand, you don't want to fault the person too much because you can see how, you know, your disposition kind of leads you towards that, right? Yeah. And that, and that's, and that, and that, and that even bleeds into some like, um, yeah. into more deterministic ideas of like biological yeah. brain kind of, and, kind of stuff. And, and also in terms of that, that's why, like, that's why I try to make the point, and it seems like I can never make this point enough that I know I'm not in one of these like ideological camps where I think that Jordan Peterson is a genius and he's right about everything, but I'm also not in this other uh, completely opposing ideological camp that I think he's a complete idiot and he has nothing worthwhile to say. I am capable of agreeing with some people about some things and disagreeing with them about others, and I agree with like these in terms of these major broad issues i lar i almost completely agree with jordan peterson about this uh, about this being a problem on college campuses well it's it's interesting to see some of the takes you get out there like i remember when i was first was freaking out about this 2 years ago when the polarization you know trump like when trump just burst on the scene i was really worried about polarization and i think you've kind of seen a lot of what I feared would happen kind of come true as you do, you do really see this kind of, it's more divided than ever, let's say, right? Yeah. Um, now there's also a narrative there too that, that Peterson puts out that in fact, that's just, and there's that study to back it up that was being shared a couple of weeks ago where it's actually, the streams are actually very small percentage of the population, right? So yeah. you know, always have to keep, yeah. the, the media, the perception role does, but then, but then you could also come back and you could say in the universities, it does look like there are pockets of universities that are like thoroughly dominated by this. Yeah. Now you still see people who try to say there's there's well, there's only smoke here, there's no fire. I, I don't, yeah. I think Hyde's done a really good job and it's so Hyde, right? Because when he first came out, he's like, oh, and I have to apologize because I'm John Hyde and I didn't actually have all the evidence yet. <laughs> but, but, but surprise, surprise, you know, I went out and collected evidence for a year and oh, oops, look at it, it's all right here. So yeah. now I can say this and you can't really label me because I'm John Hyde and that's just what I do, right? Yeah. And, and um, one thing that I've been, been been playing with recently um is kind of hopping between like these different kind of uh worldviews you know and, and as because what i've been doing a lot recently is uh i've really done this deep dive um in, into christianity right so i think in the last decade maybe 11 years i've gone from like a hardcore atheist to like trying to go as deep christian as i can and as i've started doing that and as i started listening to peterson right i've started to realize that people you know, everybody has presuppositions and everybody has like uh, implicit assumptions that are nested that ground their arguments, right? Mm -hmm. And and what I've kind of started to realize is that, and you know how people often say Peterson talks in word salad? Have you ever heard that? Yeah, that seems like a common criticism. Yeah, they say that often, right? And I, I think what I think what I've come to understand, and, and I, I'm interested to hear what you think about this, I've come to understand that um, when your presuppositions are that far apart, the way you use words, and this comes back to the definition of harm, it's almost like you're speaking different languages. And the more I've started to think about it, especially if you think of like the NPC meme where like there's like literally no communication happening, it's, oh, it's I love almost, that meme. oh, I love that meme too. It's the best thing ever. Yeah. Um, but I, I've come to understand that it's like, it's, this is my opinion, is that because people view the world different ways, which is legitimate biologically, you end up getting nested inside these idea sets and end up having like their own inherent logic and language. And like you end up talking across purposes, right? And like, so like when I talk to, sometimes when I talk to religious folk, I'm like, well, you know, you're using modern literal materialist uh, language to describe your religious phenomenon. So you're inherently looking at the world through a worldview where science is the definition of truth, right? And yeah. And, and, and then when I talk to scientifically minded people about religion and they start telling me, well, that's not what the word means. That's not what the word means. I'm like, well, actually, you know, in the religious epistemology, like these are the way the objects line up. These are the relationship between certain things. So I just, and the reason I bring that up is that, um, is that uh, when it comes to, when it comes to the postmodernist thing um, and, the, and the kind of infiltration on campuses, oh, what's the thread here? Um, Oh, well, Peterson, Peterson talks a lot about uh, concepts like responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind, of, that's kind of his jam. And that's kind of like his worldview, right? Which is like in, yeah. in, the, in the leftist worldview, it's like, okay, who's being oppressed? Who's, 
who's the oppressor, who's the right, who's the wrong, who's the strong, who's the weak, you know, it's very problem oriented. Peter Griffin's worldview is very, uh, well, you're an individual, so you, you frame things and what you can do, and then you, you, you build up from there, right? Yeah, his, and, or his perspective is very, uh, very stoic and very pragmatic too. So to come full circle, when you think, well, why is this happening? And you talked about their good intentions, right? Well, let's let's like different worldviews look at intentions differently, right? Because in a left wing worldview, let's say, or like uh, alt left worldview, as I like to call people who go that far when they start out on speakers, in an alt left worldview, it's like uh, it's very easy to say, well, I, I hold the right beliefs. I target the right enemies, ergo I'm moral, right? In a yeah. Peterson worldview, you couldn't say that. You would have to say, okay, I've taken what responsibility, ergo I'm moral. In a Christian worldview or religious worldview, you would have to say, I put the correct value, I've kept the first commandment, I put God at the top of the hierarchy that I'm interacting with, and I've made everything relationship to my to my transcendent ideal, which is my God, right? That's How all that moral too, though, right? Pardon me? That's all moral too, though, right? Well, it is. It, they're, they're different moral. They're different moral. Um, yeah. Considerations, right? And then yeah. no one's no one's right or wrong, right? Yeah, that's the reason like, that's like what Jonathan Haidt talks about. How everyone has their own worldview that they use to form their own moral values. Yeah. So when when you, so the reason so the reason I frame it this way is that I don't know if they have good intentions. Who? Like I have they're all left. Yeah. Um, and I, I say that from a, I can say I can approach that from a variety of perspectives. So I'll just give you two. I'll give you two or three, and you can just you can, we can pick which one to go with. Okay. It's like first off, it's like um, if you want to go more secular, it's like well, how how ignorant and or idealistic are you allowed to be, right? Because with so many of these policies, uh, let's say like Hype points out, there's a lot of objective evidence where you should be saying at least whoa, you know. You should have serious, serious doubts. If we, if we don't want to get too specifically into how wrong they might actually be, right? But you don't, you don't often see that. So, to what extent is that permissible? And your, your good intentions still count, right? Or you could go Peterson, and you could be, and you could go one step further, and you could say, well, you're obviously not being responsible. You're obviously not being reasonable. So then, that's not moral. You could go religious, and you could say, well, you're not even, even trying to follow the right moral principles. Like you're actively choosing the wrong moral things to do. So what, what, why would I trust your intentions? Because in a, in a Christian world, you do that's you're more or less acting in an evil way because well, you're, you're, worshiping, you're worshiping a false god. You're, I mean, not that you would hurt them, but you're worshiping a false god. You're, you're acting out really bad morals. You, you're doing human constructions. You're, like, um, you're elevating yourself in a very prideful way. Um, you're, you're transgressing a lot of, against a lot of these morals. So yeah. I just don't know exactly how blameful, uh, blameless they are. So what do you, th what do you I, think about that? Well, uh, I, I think that, like, to me, it, it seems like a problem to focus on, like, these people are doing these things so they're immoral according to, according to a particular worldview. Because like we were talking about before, I feel like Jonathan Haidt would talk about how if, you, if people are just criticizing each other and saying that you're immoral for this reason, it's not necessarily that you're you're behaving in an immoral way it's it's that you're looking at these moral values in that particular way and another person is looking at them in a different particular way so like for from these from these people's perspectives like the as you called them the alt left i think that it seems like a lot of the time they are behaving in a way that in their heads seems like a moral way like for example like some of the examples that um that jonathan Haidt and greg lukianoff use in that book the coddling of the american mind for example is that is quotes from people talking about how they think that um like for example for example if anyone if anyone is on the alt-right then they are inherently always trying to oppress me therefore committing acts of unprovoked violence of them is literally the same as justice or something like all white people are inherently always oppressing black people therefore uh committing an act of unprovoked violence against white people is inherent justice so mm -hmm. it's it like to like it, that's my point basically it's that to them they're behaving in a moral way and i think the and i think what jonathan Haidt focuses on is that 
the consequences of the way that they're behaving is what the problem is. Because regardless of how you how you look at how they frame their worldviews, like to put to put a more pragmatist perspective on it, which I think makes a lot of sense in this particular context, uh, the, which I think uh, that I would agree with Jonathan Haidt on, is that what matters is what the consequent, like what happens uh, as a consequence of these. It's not necessarily the beliefs themselves, beliefs themselves rather, it's what happens as a consequence. Yeah. Okay, so are, are you saying, because, okay, so I think I've heard maybe three points there. Are you saying something along the lines of we can evaluate the the goodness or badness? Uh, when we talk about those terms, we should apply it to the effects so that we, so there are, there is a standard there. So you're, you're applying, there is some ability for us to object, quasi objectively determine something good or bad that, that lacks, a, that lacks, um, that isn't completely relative. There's a, definitely some objective base on that. I think, I, I would think say, that. I would say like, the the way that i the way that i try to view it and the way that i've heard other people talk about this like um like thaddeus russell for example who's that historian whose podcast i love unregistered who talks about mm -hmm. postmodernism a lot and his book um a renegade history of the united states is great he talks about how um like what do you want to do to help create a world that you would want to live in so that's the way that i try to look at this like are these people doing things that would create a world that i want to live in no it doesn't seem like they are. <laughs> um well yeah and i mean and and that's like and that's where i got into conver a conversation about this with my friend it's like okay so hitler does it that's that's evil okay now the the lackey who just follows order that's a type of evil right it's like the person who doesn't realize the effect of like where 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 does your cognizance of the effects of your actions start and do you start if you don't want to use the word evil you can use the word bad right because another thing you had said too was some of these people you can you could you know and at a spirit of charity you could say well look you can spoon fend a lot of narratives uh you don't have a lot of counter information based on the facts at hand what you're doing makes sense, right? If I, if I, my viewpoint was that limited and I honestly believe the alt-right was about to kill me tomorrow, I would do the same thing, right? But what, what interests me though is as you go up that chain um, to the, to the, to the people who are more like a leadership role, even if it's indirect leadership of just, cause like if you set the ball rolling by, by just coordinating the event or getting somebody to coordinate event or identifying a target and calling people to, right? To attack it. I think some people higher up kind of see the point that you made about the consequences, and I think they still do it anyways. And this this phenomenon of people doing that, this is where this is where it really starts to get dicey because you're now playing like armchair armchair mind reader, right? But you know, like um, like uh, you'll judge them by their fruits, right? So, um, so I don't know. It, it gets a little. I get a little suspicious. I I really do with some of these folk. Like I just I really. I really wonder how much lack of self-reflection is really permissible. Like I, well, you know, I'm I think uh, like it seems to me like it's probably an accurate generalization to say that most people are NPCs. Like they just spout things without critically thinking about anything. But that being but that being said, there probably are some people who are aware of what they're doing and are do and are doing these things for malicious intentions. I just I don't uh, I don't have any data about that, but it seems to me and it seems to me like people like Jonathan Haidt think this too that that's the minority of people who are doing this kind of thing. And I, I think you brought up an interesting point there in terms of when you when you mentioned Nazis and Hitler. That reminded me of. Uh, a book that Jordan Peterson has mentioned about that before, the one called Ordinary Men, which yeah. I haven't I haven't read myself, but it seems it seems like a really awesome book, like about how there's this gradual process where if you if you kill someone, it can be it, it can be like a gradual process until okay, it's okay to rape this person now, and then like 20, 30 steps later, or however many steps later okay, it's okay to commit mass genocide. Like, it's not necessarily that these people have these full intentions that way in, in that uh, in that way in the first place. It's like they, they, get, they get drawn into 
these ideologies. So it like, and it also depends on how responsible, like in terms of responsibility that Jordan Peterson talks about, that's interesting because it, it depends on how responsible you think people, uh, you think uh, people are who spout these ideas that have followers and stuff like that. Like how responsible are people um let's say let's say at the at the top of the so-called alt left or something like that like uh an example i'm thinking of is tanahisi coates who i was watching the debate yesterday and mentioned him and they apparently apparently directly quoted him as saying that he has no sympathy for white firefighters who died saving people <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. so uh, that's a piece of work how responsible is Tanahisi Coates for like uh, for like Black Lives Matter assaulting white people in a completely unprovoked way? To me, is the same question as people who really don't like Jordan Peterson saying that he's responsible for all of his alt right and neo Nazi and white supremacist fans in a way. Yeah, I mean. Um... Yeah, it, you know, you, it, it's an interesting parallel. I mean, I, I obviously don't think it's parallel. Um, I don't know if it's worth taking the conversation in that direction. But when you come back to this idea of like responsible, um, geez, what's the, what the issue I have is that is that I, I think with a lot of these things, like you know how they're always talking about how how many people send emails saying, "Oh, I would stand up, but I won't." I would stand up, but I won't. Yeah. And, well, and, wait, wait, sorry, just a second. To to you said the road you said you don't want to go down. I'm not saying I'm not saying that uh, Tanahisi Coates and Jordan Peterson are equivalent because Jordan Peterson has never explicitly said to me anything as radical as Tanahisi Coates has. I just want to say that. Oh no, I agree. I mean, it just depending on my audience. Like, if you don't already agree with me, and I were to say that the ideas Coates say directly connect to the actions that, that would make him responsible. And I would say there's no connection between Peterson's actions and the claims of the alt left. For me to prove that thesis in any way that would convince somebody who doesn't already agree with me would be really, really hard to do. Okay, yeah, I see. Yeah. So it's 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 not it's not so productive to just, because yeah. it's just gonna sound like I'm giving an opinion, which yeah. I, I would claim it's not, but I can't give you the evidence. So so it's kind of like a dead end, okay. right? Yeah, um, I see your point. Yeah, so that's, that's what I feel about that. But um, in terms of, in terms of like, in terms of this this other idea, and I'm and it is going to circle back. It's so there's all these these people who won't stand up, right? Or there's that TED video where like they're they're doing the whole crowd, and the first person stands up to dance to the music, and then a second person will, and then a third will, and then everybody stands up, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, you've seen that, right? So there's a lot of phenomenon uh, like that, right? And this kind of comes back to your NPC thing. Like a lot of people do just kind of follow these ambient programming that's in the air, you know. And a lot of research shows that most of what you say is to is to seek approval or agreeance among people around you, not necessarily to, to approach truth, right? From evolutionary perspective, it's being being truthful isn't as advantageous, in fact, as actually cohering and bonding with your other tribesmen. I don't yeah. know. I can't, can't remember which researcher proved that. I'm bad with citing, but I, I've heard that from many locations. I'm pretty so, sure Jonathan Haidt talks about that too. Uh, probably, yeah. Haidt's book was amazing. It covered a lot of ground. And yeah, I, I think you're right. I think it is height because uh, because I really I really do buy into this idea that uh, a lot of your stuff is more programmed inside you than you realize. Peterson talks about that a lot in the Sam Harris debate, um, like your perceptual framework. That's why we can we won't go into the postmodernism, but that's why I think postmodernism postmodernism has to be related to things because once it gets built into your architecture of the way you see the world, the cascades of that just like like if you see sanctity. It's going to affect every decision you make, if you, or if you only see harm, right? Okay. But anyways, all to, to me though, was, like listen. saying like saying that like postmodernism affects your worldview, like that inevitably affects your worldview. Like the most concise way I can possibly put this is like that's like saying sociology is inevitably part of your worldview if you're a sociologist. Yes, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, of course, it's a lens. You like look at Peterson for example. It's not an accident that he did the psychological significance of the Bible. Yeah, because. Because that's the prism. That's the prism he sees the world through, right? And if I mean, you, like, if you're making that comparison to like him viewing it, viewing it from through the lens of mythology or psychology, then that's totally fair. 
yeah so we, we we all we all adopt these these lenses and so so when so when you think of like dominant media narratives what's cool you know like those kind of you know meme structures whatever you want to call them myths stories narratives uh, idea groups worldviews i mean you can, there's lots of different phrases for different uh depending on your on your purpose right um but where am i going with this we're talking about the people oh yeah so i i just find it interesting that um this this archetype that peterson talks about and it's pretty much exactly what jesus is doing through all the old testament the archetype of this or this figure or this idea that there's somebody who has to speak the truth to the power right and that's a perennial problem it's like how do you go about doing that in a constructive way right like like, uh, while, like the the logos in terms of jesus that jordan peterson talks about yeah, that it would be tied up in that. It would it would definitely because we have that capacity, right, to to do those things. So I mean, you could look at like who's trying to shift paradigms. You know, Milo does one thing; it's shock, and he kind of burnt out. Trump just goes completely opposite the uh, the other way. You know, Hillary wraps herself in like everything traditional that was right about the the status quo, and and she's going to keep it all for you and and take that next step on this long journey we've been on. Right? Everybody kind of wraps themselves in these in these paradigms, and. Um, I just find when it comes back to this, yeah. So I, I think I think what the, I think I think the response, like one of the biggest takeaways that I've had to this, is the amount of um, power that uh, a lot of people have, kind of speaking truth to it. And I, I think I think ultimately that's I think that's probably going to work. You know, like um, I, I have a very high opinion of um, the long term from like an evolutionary standpoint bad ideas just do get weeded out like they can only last they can only last so long you know especially in a, in a functioning western society and uh so i mean this this riots in france that's happening recently where they're rebelling against the gas prices oh yeah and, you're telling me about that yeah and i mean and i don't know if you saw the steve bannon debating um um what's his name um oh the guy who worked for bush jr um he switched to the left sam harris always has him on the podcasts he's a journalist Speech writer. Oh, um, sure. No, I, I I haven't seen anything with Steve Bannon uh, though. Well, Steve Bannon went to this event called the Monk Debates, and he was debating against whatever. I, I have a computer here. Steve Bannon. Oh, I think I might have seen that on YouTube, but not watched it. Yeah. Well, the topic was um, the rise of populism. Um, okay. They re they 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 changed the the results. They so let's work. So going into it was Steve Bannon versus David Frum. Okay. So the proposition was Oh, David Frum's that guy, right. Okay. Yeah. Be it resolved, the future of Western politics is populist, not liberal. So if you support it, you think that populism is going to take over from liberalism. So okay. it was Oh, now it has the exact same numbers on both. Okay, so you're not going to get any results, unfortunately. But in, in, in this in this basic uh narrative, right, you have this idea that um populism is going to end is basically on the rise as people kind of push back against let's say status quo or like the dominant power structures right because because a pop is that a fair characterization of what populism tries to do uh um, i think so yeah i would okay okay i, okay, I just wanted to logic check myself so like i see this phenomenon in a similar light to like the peterson rising phenomenon or the the, the huge rate uh, rise of joe rogan or the fact that ben shapiro has the top two articles shared on facebook right you see a lot of you see a lot of pushback against these ideas. So uh, I am i mean, I was a lot more worried about it a couple of years ago, but now I'm, I'm kind of thinking it's, its I just don't think it's viable. You know, I, I just, I, I can't imagine you could keep up something that's so baseless for that long, you know? That's um, actually, uh, that's actually kind of a similar thought um, that, uh, that my friend, Mike Spencer Bound, who I've talked with on my podcast before, um, was saying when uh, when I was talking with him about postmodernism, we were both we were both kind of agreeing that Peterson makes some good points about this this thing that's happening on college campuses, but it might not be quite as mo as big of a problem as he sometimes thinks it does, or maybe it's not quite as big of a problem as it was before, although. I would still, I would still say, and I think, uh, I think probably it's fair, it's fair for me to speak for everyone I'm talking about, including you in this conversation. But it's probably accurate that 
um, like what Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff talk about in their book, The Coddling of the American Mind, how this this is still a problem is probably valid. I think it's very valid. And I think this kind of brings me to, to like what my bugbear is nowadays is, is um, I, I don't like it. Oh, because Jonathan Haidt, you know, Jonathan Haidt talks about how you have your symbols that you rally around and you, yeah. and you spin around them. Um, you know, and, and that's usually one of those things would be God, right? And there, or you, or you could use the word axioms, or if you if you prefer, if you want to use secular language. Um, but I, I just I, the more the more I look at these things, uh, and like I'll just tell a little a little aside. When I was in, I went to geography class. I took the first two geography classes. One of my electives when I was in undergrad, and uh, it was a big mistake because first year classes are are, are uh, strainer classes, so they give you a crap ton of work to get you to leave the program. So I'm like, oh no, why did I take like this? Anyways, <laughs> so so the very first lesson that the geography teacher did was he had a model of like heritage and it was made up of like values, culture, um, a couple other things. They were doing a study on it. It was like a master's thesis, one of his students. That was the very first thing he presented. In and, geography class? In geography class. Oh, and wow, he's, okay. And, he's, and he said, why, why am I doing this in geography class? He said to the class and nobody could tell him. He's like, well, look, if, if we're gonna decide that that we wanna save this stream or, or fix this mountain or any of these issues we're gonna study, if, if we don't agree on what's valuable, then we can't come to an arrangement because if I only value economy and you only value plants, then there's no, there's no agreement we can have. If we don't have that thing we circle around where we have that common frame of reference, it's uh, resolution's impossible, right? And I think that's why you see so much polarization nowadays because people, there's there's no middle ground anymore. It's like it's like the 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 the, the solution space doesn't overlap between these between these competing point of views, and like as much as I don't want to force a monolithic of thought because like we talked about, there's legitimacy to everybody's viewpoint, right? Um, uh, you know, as a religious person, um, and you know, as a Christian, like a part of the reason I like it is that it 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 lays out what for me is a coherent hierarchy of values, right? And with God at the top. And I, and I, I don't see how you can have, like, I don't see how you can have a culture, how you can have a functioning state without it. And now, I mean, the national identity used to serve that role to some extent, but those are starting to be eroded. And like, to me, this is a very postmodernist phenomenon, right? So one example of where I think Peterson particularly hits home on postmodernism is that it's not an indictment of all postmodernist ideas, or it doesn't mean the tool isn't a valuable tool. But when you pick up that tool and you start saying, no, 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 national identity is not a thing. Uh, religious identity, no, that's not, that can't be a thing. And even if you're misapplying the ideas, right, I see a lot of that going around. And I really don't, I don't know how, I don't know how sustainable humans are without those labels to kind of, like the good form of tribalism that, that, uh, okay. that wine, the wine scenes we talk about. I think even Haidt talks about the good forms of tribalism too, doesn't he? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. so, so I don't. I don't see how you're going to get anywhere without that. So this is what really concerns me is that they, A, have the wrong values, B, they make a tribe around it, and C, I don't see what the other tribe's going to be that or symbol we can rally around. And who, I don't... Who are the they that you're referring to? Well, you can do it both directions. Okay. I mean, you could... Like the, I mean, the I, on the political spectrum, you mean? I think there's a general loss of faith that you... Uh, or belief or opinion that you actually need to have common values. Okay. Like, well, like I don't so um, in, in terms of what you were saying about postmodernism, it's not, it's not that the, it's not that they say that like these things like religion, religious identity don't exist. It's that it like, I think the best way, the best way of putting that would be that, that they would say that, these are how these religious identities are constructed. This product, this product of modernism and putting these labels, these rigid labels on people, like I am a Christian, therefore I can never integrate parts of Buddhism or Islam into my own Christianity is a product of modernism that wasn't there before maybe the 1600s or so is maybe the way that Foucault would look at it. And it's mm -hmm. not that, it's not that they don't exist. It's that they. It's that the way that people look at these labels change throughout time, and they're different from person to person. And yeah. that, and also in terms of what uh, what you were saying about um, Jordan Peterson there, and 
these uh, and in terms of values. I think uh, an important point that both Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Haidt talk about is that there it wouldn't be the best idea for there to be for there even to be one like as you said monolithic value structure for all of society because it's really important to have people with different value structures in order to out for society What's or evidence culture. For that? Can you let me finish? Oh, sorry, sorry. For culture, yeah. Both Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Haidt have talked in their lectures and in public and in their books with evidence from research that I can't recall off the top of my head about oh, how it's important for society. The, it's the best way for societies and cultures to function is to have people with different political and religious views trying to agree on enough values so that yes. we can so that we can live our lives together but that means that it's important to have christians atheists muslims buddhists anything else or agnostics or anything and it's also important to have liberals conservatives progressives anything anything else like that well i think you're i think i think i agree with like half of what you said but i think i, I think you conflated a couple things there um, so, uh, we both agree that there's a minimum set of values, right? So height would say height would probably advocate for say the truth seeking university as the paradigm with, with, within which is best to do science, right? He would not think it's an activist paradigm. Okay. Now the, this, the next, the, the grouping of values though, to believe in free speech, free association, a meritocracy based on empirical evidence, uh, based on intolerance of viewpoints with no uh, knowing allow, you have to keep it secular. Like the list of values you have to have just to construct John Heights University is pretty, pretty, it's it's really constrained. And you, and, and that's exactly what we're seeing with social justice warriors. They literally reject those values, right? Mm -hmm. And and to a certain extent, you could, you could see more and more and more, um, at, at least even the mainstream version of the Democratic Party kind of rejects those values. Uh, this becomes more true every every single every single month. You can almost say you can almost see it in real time happening, right? But you also see a pushback on the other side. So who knows where that's going to land, right? But my my point my point with this. So um, when you talk about what type of diversity you need, it's like it's intellectual yes, diversity. Intellectual, yes, exactly. But it's not necessarily the case that you actually want religious diversity. It could literally be the case that certain religions aren't compatible. Or certain right. cultures aren't compatible. It's you can't take it for granted that a viewpoint won't be a net negative to the situation because we can certainly imagine a, a, like a ten percent population of of Germany who who thought maybe maybe we should revisit whether Hitler was bad. I mean, just I don't hate to use Hitler's example, but like yeah. that is that is an edge case, and it becomes obviously like a, a Jain a Jainist. Yeah, you know, it would be more or less neutral positive by definition, right? Yeah. And, and there's there's going to be a spectrum there. And I yeah. think sometimes yeah. I think I think I think right now when you look at this balance, I think that there's far too much of a balance. Uh, the balance has shifted too much towards um, uh, a perflection of like highlighting the fact that oh well, different viewpoints carry different paradigms and uh, and we all construct them and, and kind of a postmodernist like deconstruction is useful for its for its time, right? But where's like I I'm more interested in constructive philosophies, and that's not a knock at postmodernism. I mean, it still has its place. I'm not putting it down. I'm just trying to advance my 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 other point. And, and you feel free that's to disagree, why, but yeah, I think we're that's lacking. Why, that's why, other than like I'm not like I'm not like ideologically attached to postmodernism. That's why, like I've talked with my my friend Hayden Bruce, who's the like the pragmatic Christian who we've talked about before. Um, I I also like philosophies like Stoicism and pragmatism because they're. They're more constructive philosophies. Yeah. Um, are you feel Are you familiar with uh, Yuval Noah Harari, at all? Yeah. Yeah. So I love that book, Sapiens. Yeah, I've listened to the, Sapiens too. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, so like he he's very very atheistic. Uh, he's pretty much a materialist. He he does this really interesting thing where he understands and he talks about how influential narrative and ideas are but then he also says that they're illusionary and not real it's this really weird space especially especially as somebody who believes that oh 
Yeah, like uh, like um, like money or government, for example. Yeah, he thinks those aren't real, and that's yeah. really for me. That's really funny because um, um, I was just because well, I'm, I'm trying to figure. Pardon? There's sets of ideas, so they're not they're not real in the physical way. Yes, they're not real in the physical way. But this gets back to my earlier point about different languages using words in different ways, right? Yeah, like for yeah. for for me, what's like for me, what's real is is very different than what he says what he means real. You know, because I consider like he considers the table more real than an idea, whereas I consider the table far less real than an idea. You know, um, that's a, so that's, a, that's a pretty postmodern perspective, actually. Well, to me, it's a religious perspective because like, yeah. one thing that one thing that Jesus says, he says, it's like he talks about like uh, I was just reading the book of John recently. He's talking about eat my body, eat my blood. And he's talking about the, the spiritual wisdom. And he's saying, I'm not I keep saying I'm not of this earth. And he's constantly de-emphasizing and the Buddhists do this, too. Right. Um, de-emphasizing the material. Right. And sometimes that's taken to mean that the material is not important. That's not the way I look at it. I look at it where the actual action is especially with human beings is, is, is in the idea realm because it's really as ideas walk through us, as our culture acts through us, that's where all the, uh, that's where all the interesting things really occur. Right. That's why um, mixed mental arts says the cultural confessions, right. That's where all the action is. And that's, and that's, and that's, and that's what Jesus is talking about in my opinion, when he talks about the way, and do you see what I'm talking about? He's, he's talking about, He's trying to keep reminding you. It's like, it's really what you believe and how you act that out. This is the reason I'm here talking to you. It's not, it's, it's not about the laws. It's not about your possessions. It's about what are you actually, how do you perceive the world and your place in it? That's really what's going to determine uh, what, where we're going to go. And yeah, so I mean, I, I don't know, man. It's, it's just, I, 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 I don't have any, if I, if I had answers, I'd be, I'd be, I would probably be a lot richer because I, I have to be super perspective to have them. But I, I do, I am, I am fairly disconcerted by this fragmentation process that's going on. And as the social justice phenomenon is now round, it's now the idea that it's a religion is just, it's, 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 it's only a matter of time before majority of people believe that. I'm, I'm sure it's already, I can see it just growing and growing, and growing the references. Well, it, all know it is a religion, basically, in the same way that a lot of uh, ideological idea sets are. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm more of a Petersonian in this respect. I believe every action is a religious action because it's your your values are always implicit in your actions. So I would I would never draw that distinction. I think yeah. everybody has it. Yeah, yeah that's what this coffee is really religious. It's actually very religious. It actually really is. <laughs> It really is, and that and that also kind of gets back to why what's what's real kind of changes because for me it's like the intentions of what you're di doing, the idea, the idea set that led you to actually be a person who would have coffee and be drinking it at yeah. what time? <laughs> what time at night? <laughs> you know, nine uh, eleven. Yeah, there's a lot of nested information in the fact that you're drinking coffee at nine eleven, right? Sounds it's like you completely dis or completely agree rather with uh, Hayden Bruce's pragmatic perspective on this because i think he basically has the same perspective i i don't see how you can get around it i really don't um uh, i think we had this conversation <laughs> for for a long time last time like you know, like you think even like scratching my ass is a religious thing to do basically uh, yeah basically but yeah. anyways so without going back without rehashing that um I just Harari was talking about how uh, like he, he was talking about like the tech religions he thinks are going to be risen, oh, and yeah. yeah. So I just think that I think that as as the adults in the room, uh, I think people need to start having a more and, and Height's been onto this for a long time. I think we need to ha start having a more coherent discussion about like like really what's the relative merit of different values. Or, yeah. or or wanting yeah. or wanting different ends, because right? I because everybody kind of keeps it implicit, right? Because people will yeah. say, "Well, I support human life, therefore I'm anti-abortion," or "I support caring for people, therefore uh, I, I want to let people across the wall." And nobody, yeah. no, nobody, everybody, nobody doesn't want to care for people, and nobody wants to kill babies. So, like to say yeah. that is you're dodging the question. It's like yeah. what's the what's the relative trade-offs, right? It's like it, like no one like far a very small amount of people actually have 
like liberal conservative or liberal liberal perspectives rather on every single issue or conservative perspectives on every single issue especially if you're talking about people who actually think critically about these sorts of issues yeah um that's what that's one thing that jonathan Hype uh kind of talks about in uh in the righteous mind he talks about how he was like he was a he was pretty he was pretty liberal and kind of far left before he started working on the righteous mind but then he became more politically centrist as he learned that some conservative values and some religious values can have some merit and like you were just talking about if there if there are all these um if there are all these like extremely progressive values and you don't have these ideas like the value of honor or honor culture or something like that that's one reason i think he ta i think he's talked about this before that one of the reasons why uh conservative collectives like groups of conservatives can be more successful as groups than liberal collectives is that conservatives tend to value honor and loyalty more than liberals tend to yeah it's um it's a very interesting phenomenon yeah it's um group group cohesion is such an, an such an important thing like i'm a, like i'm an i'm an uh, i'm an entrepreneur and you know uh and i've worked with a lot of engineers and the the human element alone the human coordination element alone forget how good you are at your work how good your idea is how much money you have what clients you didn't or didn't did or did not get just managing the human aspect is just uh it really is where it's it's it's, it's just so challenging um yeah. i mean and um, that's and that's and that's why my name is like i i posted all of what two videos i can just never seem to get the energy to, to to make any but uh that's why i'm shane from news center because um because i was worried about this issue i was trying to imagine like what what would have what what's like the mo because like that's what the legislators are supposed to be right like that's like it's 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 so hilarious it's like it's like we're basically talking here we, we think we're so smart and we're basically rediscovering democratic government you know like and, and <laughs> you know like like i have this great idea we should like put people different viewpoints and like they should argue reach consensus and vote on things and then they can like yeah. establish the will of the people like why don't we do oh shite that's yeah we, we already did that it's just not working anymore or, maybe, or maybe, maybe uh this uh an essential aspect of that called coming to compromises about issues should be one that is focused on um yeah i mean maybe it's something like that i i mean i'm i'm more of like a decentralization of power kind of guy um so you have more like responsive units you can actually kind of have buy-in um that's another reason why i feel particularly threatened by by the uh by the alt left because it's not only that they they raise up values that I I think are counterproductive. They also kind of do it in a way that uh, it's such a command and control kind of way of looking at reality, and it just doesn't it doesn't function in a chaotic, random, complex system. It's just not a it's not a sophisticated way to interact with a problem set. It's it's a authoritarian, as you said. Yeah, it's um, it's um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's it's, it's kind of nuts and. Um, I don't know, man. I don't know. Like, um, I don't know how much more there is to say on that particular topic. I don't know if you want to uh, you want to try to switch gears, or uh, or do you want to do you want to call it a success? Or well, if you want, we could talk more about um, like I wanted to talk more about. Um, well, I guess we we kind of already talked about the political aspects of this too. But um, if you wanted, we could talk more about mythology and history like some of the the history of these different values and uh like different mythological different mythologies and different ways that they're looked at i think some of that is a little bit relevant to this too well i think it's very relevant have you uh have you are you familiar with the with the the like the uh, group selection versus uh whatever darwin believe whatever um dawkins believes in debate oh yeah the, Group selection versus a uh, selfish gene, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, something, again, something like that. Mixed mental arts and Jonathan Haidt were the two of the things that exposed me to that in the first place. And I'm very, I'm very much convinced with uh, 
like what I've read from Jonathan Haidt and what I've heard from uh, David Sloan Wilson and uh, other people talk about it. And I'm very convinced by this group selection narrative. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't remember. I think, I think if I, if I remember serves me, basically somebody did some mathematical proofs that seemed to be pretty convincing that group selection doesn't make sense. And I, I, it may have had something to do with just picking really bad examples of what a group selection mechanism would be. I think it's something like that. I've, I've, I've actually asked what's his name who did, um, oh, the guy, the Orthodox Jew, the guy who was, who was Orthodox Jewish heritage, giant beard. He wrote the book. Um, he's at Stanford. He's the primatologist and, um, Robert Sapolsky. Yeah. Sapolsky. I asked Sapolsky oh, to yeah. come. I love Sapolsky. I asked, yeah, I asked Sapolsky to, to explain to me in a nutshell what the difference was uh, when I when he was in when he was in town because I still did. it was kind of a waste of a question, but um, I just asked him to weigh in on that for a second. But um, so, but recently, like, so yeah, Sloan talks about culture evolution, and then the the phrase that Brett Weinstein uses is lineage. Um, so, like, because because if you're a part of a lineage, that would explain why you could afford if your lineage has a has a meme system in it or a myth, let's say, of the warrior class. And you're always sacrificing 10% of your men to the warrior class mean, uh, sorry, warrior class myth of they go out and, you know, patrol the frontiers. Um, that's going to provide, it, 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 to the extent that that, like that, um, and then Dawkins and, and Brett Weinstein talked about this. So have you seen their debate? Oh, yeah, I watched that recently. I thought that was yeah. really interesting. It, it so, seemed yeah. to me like, uh, like Brett Weinstein had a more new a much more nuanced perspective on evolution than richard dawkins does well here's the bitter pill for me you know dawkins had a stroke a couple of years back right no i didn't know that yeah he had a stroke a couple of years back and he hasn't been as fiery since now i've been i've been i've gone on so many rants about how dawkins and harris don't understand evolution at all and i get <laughs> really i get really really worked up about it and um but I was so bittersweet because Dawkins, he, he, he didn't, I don't think he was all there. And, I, and, if, and if he's fine, then, you know, stay on me for thinking so little of him. But he was just so feeble that I, I had to assume it was a medical condition. So I couldn't even take joy in watching him get his, like, <laughs> but, but, um, but anyways, this, so this lineage, lineage idea and what Brett's basically saying is that you end up having this co-evolution of ideas uh, with the genes. That's why the that's why he was trying to put forward in a serious sense that the beaver dam could you could call the beaver dam the locust and they're creating the they're they're selecting for the beavers to maintain themselves. This comes back to the ideal realm being more important because when you start looking at how causality works, it's very interesting where you want to put that locus of where your causality is. But anyways, this li this lineage theme, um, how do we get on? How do we get on this in the first place? Uh, I was talking. Uh, I oh, was the myths, myths. So yeah. So here's yeah. here's my here's my contention with myths, right? And this is this is part of the reason why I started getting into religion in the first place. Um, even before I was, uh, maybe even before I, I started believing in God. Um, well, like like when you create these stories and these narratives, and like our ancestors pass them down and spend all this energy organizing their li like the like the lineage selection function. Is is uh, the ideas in the culture is a big part of that because our genes aren't really that different, right? So like like the idea that your your lineage is that genetically superior to another, not nah, I mean there's there's certain aspects of it, but that's not that that can't be the most determinant thing, right? It's these lineage yeah. phenomena of cultures and myths. So I just took those with a lot more kind of seriousness, and and I mean that's that's where I would that's where I would start. Like if if Ed was here, this is where the conversation would start to break down <laughs> because. Because that's, like that's where Brett Weinstein that that's one area where Brett Weinstein disagrees with Richard Dawkins about religion, right? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, Brett. I mean, I I don't think Brett gets it. Um, to be honest with you, like, because because he what he'll see he'll say something like, "Okay, these myths have are, are useful, and you know they they combine it with our DNA." And then he and I just listened to this earlier today. Actually, he was talking on. Um, on the Rebel Wisdom podcast, uh, Rebel Wisdom, which is it's a great, uh, great thing. Anyways, he was basically saying though, but look, we're in a new environment, um, so these myths are no longer going to serve the environment, right? Because, and then the examples he cites are things like global warming, the, the power to blow ourselves up, the mass communications, right? And in this respect, he's right. We are in a very novel environment. The rate of change is getting ridiculous, and anybody under forty knows that. Uh, like, 
very vividly in their own life, I, I assume. I mean, that's the daily grind for all of us. It's just how, I, I don't know how much you experience that, but for me, it's, the world's just nuts. The amount of new things I have to learn uh, just to kind of stay in the same place is just ridiculous. You're not, and, you're not that much older than me. You're 33, right? Yeah, I'm 33. I'm yeah. 29. Yeah, so there you go. So yeah, pretty much the same bracket. And uh, you weren't born in 90, so that's great. Anybody born in 90 yeah. plus, nuts of those. Uh, I was technically born in 89 by like two or three months. Well, there you go. You made it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, but so, yeah, so anyways, so the problem I have with what Brett says, though, is he claims that this, this is a new environment. But if you if you look at the world not as an objective scientist, which is the, the language and realm he looks at, if you look at the epistemology of myth, the epistemology of myths is 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 the story of a, of a person navigating the world. It's not a world of facts. Okay, it's a world of action. Okay, so uh, and uh, Paul Vanderclay talks about this a lot. If you ever want to go deep dive into, anyways. But so the point is, the point, the thing I think he misses is that in the world of action, the world of myth, the world of story, which we embody because we all have our own story, the problems actually, and this is where I, I would like to see your opinion on this actually, because I'd like to hear somebody else say, I don't, like when I read the Bible or I, I see basic psychological, basic orientation, basic day-to-day -day value claims about how you should live your life and what you should prioritize. It's like the age old questions like that, that just, they're just, they're so elemental to to basic life it doesn't like the bible doesn't have an opinion on global warming it doesn't have an opinion on the free market it doesn't have an opinion on democracy it doesn't have an opinion on these things it's like it's it's not related so this idea that we've somehow out, outgrown them and the environment's changed it's like no i'm still a human being so my, my idea space in, in these realms need to change but in terms of like how i treat my neighbor and my basic 10 values and my like my basic hierarchy i, I don't really think that's changed very much and then another problem that I have, and I, maybe I have an ego complex because I'm like the only person who understands evolution. I sometimes feel this way. <laughs> like it, it just gets really, I'm like, because evolution's a conservative phenomenon, right? Like, do you know how evolution makes me do, well, keep one finger out? They, I, I read, I suppose he said this. Suppose he says in his book, so the way that happens is uh, I have the retract claw mechanism. I trigger that in my brain. And then another part of my brain says the ignore that command for the one finger mechanism. Like that's an example of how conservative evolution is. So, um, so what that means to me is you don't get to get rid of old programming. You always kind of build upon it. You can tweak around the edges, but like once, once, once religion, feeling religious is built into your literal brain and is connected to your tribal sensitivities, connected to your disgust sensitivities, it's connected to your like your moral foundations of literally how you conceive the world. The idea that you're not going to build upon that system is ridiculous, and. Um, and this is what I find so frustrating with a lot of like secular humanists or atheists um, is and not that not that Christians really have a better solution nowadays that to, to, to the current problems. But I find so frustrating is that Brett's basically saying like, OK, we should like recognize the truth of evolution, how that affects reality. But he, that doesn't give you uh, this defining the problem really well like that doesn't tell you how you manifest uh, a communal response to a situation. Like That's the whole reason you created religions. To have that thing to rally around, to have that language to organize around, to bring it all the way back, right? So, um, yeah. Well, so yeah. The, so this, uh, um, like this, is, you reminded me of how, um, like how Jonathan Haidt talks in in the Righteous Mind about how the utility of religions that still exist for many people and how there can be many useful aspects of religion for many people, and you also reminded me when you were talking about that book I, I mentioned to you earlier the gift of death by by Derrida that if if you were to read any book by a postmodern writer I think that would be one that you would like because like I was saying it kind of talks about mythology from a much more favorable perspective than the way that you could interpret someone like Foucault talking about religion sometimes and it's kind of a kind of similar to what you were saying. It's kind of about how these ideas and the way that we look at these religious ideas are an important part of our of our culture. And like uh, like we were saying, like uh, I, we were talking about the last time we talked too. Um, I I agree with Jonathan Haidt that and Jordan Peterson that everyone is ideological or religious about something. And like you were saying, and I was agreeing last time, and I was saying, giving an example that 
if I had to choose one, my higher purpose or the thing that I am religious is about is my creative expression and writing and things like that. So that's why I think that like explicit religions in the way of organized religions like Christianity or everything like that, they're not, they're not necessary for everyone because people can live without them and have more of this kind of like existentialist mindset. Like that's why I love my favorite nonfiction book is Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning because it's an existentialist message. It's that there is no meaning to life. So that means you get to create your own meaning and you can choose okay. that is your meaning for life. Um, there's, there's a bunch of things I could pick up on on that. One thing I just want to mention, I want to mention two things in passing and I'm going to go with the third one. The first, the first thing I want to mention is that Part of the problem with these with these myths is we can sit here and we can agree that narrative plays this role and ideas play these roles. But for people like Ed, who are very empirically minded, it's very hard to talk about this in an empirical sense. And I find I find that uh, I find a lot of the people who dis who don't like religion the most fervently, it's because their mind really doesn't like talking in a narrative way about things. Like yeah. They, they they want they want things to be like propositional and evidence based, and then there's a set of facts. And the moment you move to a different language, let's say, uh, they really don't like that. Um, yeah, third, totally. Se yeah. Second, as as a Christian, I like to let you say that there's no meaning and just let that slide. Like, I I can't I can't have that. Even even before I was a believer in God, because ob objective purpose is just is built right into me. I never made a choice but, about. That. But you but you and I agree that we can't be objective too. So. Uh, I'm not saying that there is objectively no meaning. I mean that there's no me there's no objective meaning that we know about. So we can choose to have our own meaning for life. Yeah, well, that, yeah. Um, uh, maybe we'll go down this rabbit hole, but uh, but to try to like just put a counterpoint and move on to the next thing. Uh, see, but that that you that you presuppose there isn't revelation, right? Because the basic premise of religion is that what happened is humans beings started interacting with reality and they realized certain things worked and certain things didn't. They discovered that there was good and evil. That's what the Genesis says, right? So you discover objective morality, like you're a guy in the jungle and you discover it. So once you discover that, whether you want to call it God or uh, the the selection mechanism evolution, if you're a pragmatist, let's say, uh, there is, there's actually this thing that your survival or your success depends on. You might not be able to measure it correctly and you might not know what it's doing, but it's there, you know. And a religious person strikes a covenant with that. Um, that's what that's what you do with God. You create a covenant with reality, and then and you try to negotiate your deal with this objective thing that exists outside you. That's the basic premise of a religious worldview. This is where we got into a big disagreement last time because I don't think, like, I don't think that there is objective reality, but that's not an objective statement. Like, uh, I think that. It's reason, it, and that being said, like uh, it's reasonable to assume and act as if there is an objective reality. So, from a pragmatic perspective, then a pragmatist might say that that means that you do believe in objective reality. And in that case, I would say it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter one way or the other whether you believe it or not. What matters is whether you behave as if it is. Like if you have a if you have the perspective that there is no objective reality and therefore you use it as an excuse to never get out of bed and never do anything with your life, then I think that that's not a very helpful perspective. But like uh, one example that I've heard Thaddeus Russell use before about this is that uh, I don't have to believe in objective reality to get on a plane and assume that it will Go on. My dog, my dog barking. Did you hear the last part of what I said there? I don't have to believe in objective reality to get on a plane. Did you go past that? To get on a plane and arrive at my, de to assume that I can get on a plane and arrive at my desired destination. Like we yeah. can make a lot of assumptions with yeah. a very high degree of certainty that we will be right. Yeah. Um, geez, do I want to pull that thread more? Um, I, I would probably say something about nested assumptions, which would actually would actually show that. Uh, anyways, I, 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 I yeah, 
how do I say this properly? I do agree that in a function, in, in a lot of examples, you can, uh, you don't necessarily have to have these very complicated idea structures seemingly to, to do to do simple actions. But I, I think everything's kind of nested in something. And um, like a, like my dog, for example, does not know of this idea of objective or subjective reality. But he lived a pretty good life without even thinking about these things. Well, it's kind of implicit inside the dog, though, because implicit inside the dog is a behavior pattern, like from an evolutionary perspective, implicit inside the dog is a behavior pattern trying to match an environment. That's what evolution yeah. says is occurring, right? So yeah. implicit, implicit in that is 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 the action as if there's a standard that is going to judge the dog. Yeah. So if the dog acts as if there is a real standard that it will be held accountable to. And yeah. that's why and it has instincts to negotiate that so um yeah. so the moment you're a biological being i think by definition you 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 are purposeful like i think it's inescapable because uh just descriptively speaking but i probably said this all before i think i i think the slight difference that i have with you on that is that i think that like we inherently look for our purpose like that you could definitely say that's that that's point. embedded into our evolution we look for our purpose in life and we follow whatever our purpose may be yeah now th this is what uh, this whatever is what we think it is see well this this is this this point you this point you say is uh reminds me of an interesting the closest i think you can get to actually bridging the narrative way of looking at the world in the empirical way is that um you, you get enough empirical descriptive evidence that something's real. Okay, so you actually think descriptively, you see it, right? So you descriptively see purpose, for instance, right? Now, what a religious person would then say is, I think, I take on faith that that's reflecting a true, the truer nature of reality. So mm -hmm. it's not, so it's, so you can't prove purpose. This is Brett Weinstein's right about that, right? Yeah. But like, I would say like, what Occam's razor, if everything looks as if their objective purpose exists, it looks like it's following a purpose. It's all is it? It's all reflective as if as if there was actually purpose. Then to walk away from that, and I think I've already said this before. To walk yeah. away from that, yeah. So, but to come back to come full circle to something we were talking about a little while ago when we talked about like okay, so what? Or, or even to Thaddeus Russell's plain example. So, what does it matter about these beliefs? Because you're right on an individual level, it doesn't matter when I get on the plane. Now, um, have you ever heard this example of like uh, the macro organism? like the, the proper way to look at a hive of bees isn't as the individual bee it's the whole hive right oh yeah yeah okay now um i think that applies to humans in a way that modern society just doesn't recognize at all because uh modern society is very big on the individual even when you talked about what well, individual cannot have can have this belief system be functional an individual can do this an individual believes that an individual does this action but that's not how humans operate like like because because even in this house, I'm nested inside a whole bunch of relationships that allow my life to work, right? Like I don't, yeah. like my, my, my belief system, if it does, if it does stops working with my co-founders, the four people who live in my house and, and it stopped working with the chick I was dating recently, there's consequences to all these things, right? Yeah. Well, so, I, think, I think that you and I probably agree that it's not that people only behave as individuals or they only behave as collectives. It's that we behave as individuals within collectives and it's, there's this endless connection between the two. Yeah, well, and then, well, that's where you have like uh, a complexity theory. You have like emergent structures, right? Yeah. You familiar with this idea yet? Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I, I think we don't, we don't, I think we, one way to talk about the problem I have this would come back to the same postmodernist idea thing. It's like, I don't think people appreciate, um, and this is lineage level evolution, the emergent phenomenon of the lineage, the emergent phenomenon of the human culture, the emergent phenomenon of the of that political block you're a part of. So you could say, oh, um, let's just pick a belief. Um, what would be an example that won't be offensive or controversial? Um, oh, offensive okay. Controversial examples are fine too. Okay, so, so as... Well, no, we, we, we get contentious whether what I, what I was saying was true. But okay. I mean, like, um, uh, like you could say if one given person doesn't care about dogs, you could say that's permissible, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I think it wouldn't be contentious that once you get past a certain tipping point of people who don't view dogs as having a special relationship, the humane society is not going to do what it's going to do. The funding might drop off. Um, they, they all of a sudden dogs might not be allowed in certain parts of, of like in certain cultures they aren't allowed to go commonly so then eventually it's going to have this cascading effect of the dog population going down right and i think a lot 
Do you think that would be a specific number or specific proportion of a population, and would it vary between populations? Well, well the way the way you would describe it with an epistemology of complexity theory, so which is derived derived from physics, um, you know, the way you'd look at that is will be ages in the system, right? So the way you would look at it is you would go how many times, like if I'm one agent, what is, what's the likelihood that I'm going to go if I can only go to one dog park as opposed to walk on the street anymore? How many people is that going to dissuade from having dogs, dog, dogs, right? And how many agents do you have to have voting a certain way to pass that bylaw? And this, so you 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 have a emergent causality, you'd have upwards causality, right? And then once you have the law, that's a form of downward causality affecting each of the agents in turn. That's the emergent structure coming back to affect the thing below it, right? That's so the, that's the way that um, Zygmunt Bauman, who's a sociologist who writes about sociology from a postmodern perspective. That's like almost exactly the same way that he's described culture. Well, that's, yes, and that's, and that's how, that's one of, that's one of the first ways I thought about God. God is an emergent phenomenon that has a huge top-down causal effect, right? Like if you go small G, I think God. This is, I think this is, uh, this is probably one of the reasons uh, why my friend James Sullivan, who uh, knows more about postmodernism than me, who you might have seen, I've talked to him on my podcast a few times too. I think that uh, that's one of the reasons, like that perspective is one of the reasons why he recently, once uh, he got married recently and his, his wife wanted him to be Christian. So I think like that sort of perspective is one of the things that allowed him to do that because there's this perspective, especially from Derrida, like I mentioned about how he often talks about how complex mythology is and how like like uh, i think i watched uh, this talk by rick roderick on derrida and my conclusion that i posted about that was it seems like derrida is basically a buddhist he kind of talks about how like there are mythologies all over the place and we all choose one and it's fine it's fine to exist with your mythology in with a bunch of other mythologies and if you choose to believe in mythology it's not necessarily a bad thing or harmful for you in fact it can be beneficial in many ways yeah it it it's it, well, it's really sorry i i phased out what's the, what was the last point you you ended on sorry that that mythology that mythology is not choosing a mythology is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a good thing for many people and have be a good thing in many ways. Yeah, is it is it possible that Derrida wrote a book on complexity theory? It's possible. Yeah, I'm I'm less aware I'm less aware with his work than uh, than Foucault, but there was a. Uh, uh, I forget who it's by, but there was this uh, this book on complexity theory, I think from a postmodern perspective that that guy Tim Keefe recommended to me who has a master's degree in philosophy. And I talked to him on my podcast after James Sullivan had done three long podcasts with him. But it was a book that he recommended to me about complexity theory. I think it was a, from a postmodern perspective, but I don't remember who the author was, although I'm I'm like 99.9% .9 sure that it wasn't Derrida. It, uh, it wasn't Derrida? Because no. I, I'm, I'm fairly confident that I read a complexity theory book by a Derrida. Oh, okay. And and it would just be so ironic if if this whole time, because I loved that book. Like I thought I thought the way it described, it was it was a lot of gobbledygook kind of language. It was very dense and hard to read. Yeah, postmodern writers tend to be like that. It's very confusing language. But but no, for me for me I just had to think really hard. But then I eventually got it because it was talking in a lot of metaphor. Um, it was basically it was like the linguistic equivalent to like physics equations as, as far as I was concerned, right? Because you're trying to usually you'd map these things up mathematically. So to do it linguistically, I just was was really impressed with it. But um, but um, yeah. So with so with these with these myth with these myth phenomenons and like and the way the way that the way that space. The way that evolutionary space comes back to influence things, it's um, it's so here. I'll, I'll, I'll run an interesting idea by you. Um, you talked earlier about um, uh, how you have the choice to kind of be creative with your with your artistic pursuits, right? And and how important that was to you too, right? Yeah. And I, I really I really like the logos. Obviously, the word is is really good. As a, as a, as a religious person, that I'm obviously jamming with that right now, and. One thing I found interesting that I was talking about yesterday was 
how I kind of like that when you get to the end of empiricism, which is where we and Ed, like where Ed will refuse to go any further, right? Like once you can't empirically say it, like that's that's the limit. You can't go yeah. any further. And and he and he has this term faith heads, right? And the thing thing yeah. him and I would the thing <laughs> the thing him and I would argue about is like, well, dude, it's like with the lack of evidence, and this is, comes back to the simple assu assumption point, right? Like you often use very simplistic uh, rough hands of things. When, and that's just, I mean, I, so one thing I find kind of interesting though, cause, cause as I've, as I've moved from not believing in God at all to becoming very faithful, like, and, I, as, and as I watch myself make this transition and I actually decide to have faith in things, so I used to be a very rationalist. I'm like, what are you doing here? Like, what, are, how exactly are you able to extend that, 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 that leap, right? And I just decided to just do it. And I would, luckily I was able to make, I was able to do that and it was genuine, but I've come to see that there's a certain amount of freedom in it because, uh, cause like you talk, you think you can create your own values, right? So, uh, which I, which I don't fundamentally don't agree with. Cause I believe the values are discovered and they're objective because like reality reveals the variable, the, the reality reveals what's going to work or not to you. You don't necessarily, well, you, you, you interact with it. But anyway, the point but, I'm trying to but make. If you, but if you said, like you've said last time, that everything is a faith claim, then how can you claim that anything is objective? Um, well, it's like it's like you're you're circling you're circling around it, getting ever closer. You know, like you're you're ever closer, approximating it. So but it's kind of like an like an ideal, like an enlightenment, like value to aim at, as Jordan Peterson would put it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, or if you want to use complexity theory language, there's nothing would, wrong with that. Well, you, and you can even go further, like in complexity theory language, is, is there could be multiple truths that are competing on a, on a fitness landscape, right? So it's it's like depending on contingent facts, like there could be a different, if there were different timelines, it put into being in one reality, what would be truly a good way to operate would be very different than another. But I, I find it kind of, I find it kind of liberating because basically you can, you can only go so far um, with how much evidence you have that at a certain point, whether you choose to or not, you're going to have to implicitly buy into a value structure and act it out, right? And um, and some people, like, so Ed does that. Ed can't help but do that. But he would say, I'm not making any faith claims. And then I would say, well, Ed, you're acting out on insufficient evidence by definition, so you are making faith claims, whether they're explicit or yeah. implicit. So I well, find one... Um, rationalism is its own ideology based on faith claims. Exactly. Yeah. Well, because everything has to be based on faith claims, because we can't know the objective, assuming it even exists. But I find it kind of, the idea that I found interesting recently is it was because as I'm having to buy, as I'm buying into more and more of like the doctrinal kind of Christian beliefs, like it's one thing to believe in God and one thing to say I want to follow the ultimate hippie, and you'd be like, okay, now I'm a Christian, I'm done. Okay, it's a little bit different to say, okay, but now I'm a Christian and I actually believe that God was incarnate and God literally rose from the dead. Like once you start getting more into like actually believing in individual verses, you're kind of, you're making a lot more faith claims. Let's say you're making bigger faith claims, right? And I find it kind of liberating that you could actually choose to make those faith claims. Like, because I, I, 10 years ago, I would have thought it'd be something you'd always want to avoid. Whereas now I'm kind of thinking, maybe that's the only free will I really have. Is, is because at the end of the day, the empiricism is going to be what the empiricism is. Like maybe the only real freedom I have is to pick, is maybe to know what faith claims I'm picking and actually try to be aware of what values I'm actually acting, acting out, what actual leap of faith am I taking, what implicit right. purpose am I, am I buying into. Yeah, and I, I agree. I agree with that. I think that, uh, I think that uh, that's why I think that it's a good idea to be like, to be aware of, what faith uh, what faith claims you're looking for and i think like you were saying too it's uh it's 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 even it's even important for society to function for there to be multiple different uh ideologies or sets of faith claims that people ha have like it's it's that idea of moral pluralism that jonathan Haidt talks about and it's also since i, I know you're a fan of pragmatism it's what William James talks about in his varieties of religious experience. How do you reconcile that with the fact that monotheistic religions tended to, to dominate the idea space for like over 2000 years? Mm, I don't know. I, well, I would say that one of the major reasons is that there's become like people, there's become more of a plurality of different perspectives and 
culturals have, or I mean, not culturals, cultures have become less religious than they used to be. So there's more secularism, and there's maybe a, maybe particularly in Western in Western societies, there's more like multiculturalism and more mixing in of different religions and stuff like that. Especially as that maybe increases with the with the technology and the increase of the internet and stuff like that, people having more access to re information about different religions than they had before. So what, what's, yeah, what, what, what about, so what about Peterson's thesis that by, by inviting a deconstructionist uh, lens into the situation, which would allow you to deconstruct narrative and, and, and then and pretty much operate with the viewpoint you have, right? Because look at your viewpoint. You just said you're going to create your own values. You had to focus on your individual, your individual narrative as your prize, your primary orienting thing. So you said creativity. Okay. Mm -hmm. like, this is, this is, this is, this is something that Peterson thinks is nefarious to a certain extent. Is this, is this, 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 isn't that something he advocates for? Uh, no, because he advocates for you. He advocates for the locus of resolution for analysis to be the individual. Okay, but the, he, he always quotes that Pajot guy. And the Pajot guy says you have to align your interests with your current self, yourself in a year, yourself in 10 years, not just you, your, 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 the concentric circles, right? Yeah. And then Peterson will say that's a very uh, tight idea space. And then the Bible would say, straight is, straight is the gate, narrow is the path that leadeth onto life, and few there be that find it. This And this comes back to the idea of objective morality, uh, because there's a very tight solution set that will actually work a big solution set that won't right so that's why i think it's more that there are many solution sets that will work but many but there are some that will work like there's a spectrum there's there's some that will work a lot better than others on one end of the there's some that will work really well on one end of the spectrum and there's some that will not work very well at all on other ends of the spectrum but there's not necessarily like one that will work far better than all of the rest of them is what I would say. Yeah, well, because immediately you start getting into like what timeline uh, idea sets are like building blocks too, right? Because you can pick and you can pick and put them all together in sorts of different ways, and then each of them have their own little selection mechanism on each idea, and each group of ideas has its own selection mechanisms and the ability to propagate. So it gets it gets stupid nonlinear really quickly, right? Yeah, um, which means it's a really impossible to model, which is why we don't have any empirical information about it. Um, which is why you would use myth and stories to communicate these ideas in the first place, because it's the only real way to get something that's that complicated. Um, um, the issue, the issue I take though is that um, uh, is like when I asked you why did monotheism take over, it's we, we we see we don't we see a lot of evidence for the opposite question. No, I asked. I asked. Uh, if 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 multiple moral systems existing in parallel was so was so advantageous, why does the why does the evolutionary past seem to show a strong preference for like mono like mono like monocultures and mono idea sets? Or to the extent oh. that there are multicultural systems, they're usually heavily kept under a very strong hierarchy of a central culture or idea I'm set. Not, I'm not necessarily making like an evolutionary claim one way or the other. Well, like this. Well, I, I like as a pragmatist, like uh, and as an evolution, as a big believer in evolution, it's like this is where I would take. This is where I, this is how I cash out claims, right? Mm -hmm. So if somebody if somebody's going to try to put forward something as being moral or desirable, I'm like, well, how does this cash out evolutionarily? Because that's the system well, you're operating. You're operating it, right? Well, you can look at like like you can find like evolutionary psychology arguments that both that both support the merits of religions and societies and you can t find studies that show that religious pe people are happier but you can also find the opposite that atheists are happier because that well, is what you can find uh, you can find studies that show that show anything that you want to prove in that well, sense let's use the word culture instead of religion then because okay. i think because you you don't agree that a religion is ubiquitous the way that I I think it is. So, but we both agree that culture is ubiquitous. So let's let's use that term. Well, uh, I, it, it I mean it depends on what you mean by religion. Well, does every does every single human being have a culture? Like, in, I said, yeah. like, okay, yeah. does every single human being have a religion? 
Well, like I said, it depends on what you mean by religion. Okay. If, you mean, okay. if you mean it in the like the really broad Jonathan Haidt sense, then I would say yes. Like in the same way that I would, uh, you could say that my religion is my creative expression. Yes, exactly. Yes. So it's like, so what I'm basically arguing is I don't know, uh, to a certain extent, it's, a, it's, it's an empirical question. It might be hard to measure, but uh, you probably could summon some amount of evidence to kind of bolster these claims. But my hypothesis is that if you, like from my understanding of history, I, I, I think the weight of evidence shows a tendency towards functional societal systems to not be multicultural. I don't know if you can... I don't know where the evidence is that multicultural societies are actually viable. Like just all value judgments of xenophobia or preference for one culture or another aside. I just, I find it interesting that people will talk in a way as if not only as if it's possible that it's that, but as if the default assumption is that multiculturalism is beneficial. And I find that I find if I can't have the, if I don't have the evidence to say it's not beneficial. I don't know where the evidence to say it is beneficial is, but I find a lot of people talk as if it's taken for granted that that's a good thing. The same way they take for, for granted the idea that having everybody having their own little individual moral system is a viable system. Whereas that's, that's never been. But that's, but that's how people are though. Everyone does have their own little uh, like particular perspective on it. Like that's what, but like that's what Jonathan Haidt and even Jordan Peterson talk about. Like, well, how, well we're contradicting uh, ourselves though, because earlier we talked about how many people were NPCs. Okay. Yeah. Uh, earlier we talked about the the the, the 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 not wanting to make waves. Okay. Uh, earlier we talked about how you're nested inside a whole bunch of social relationships, which really limit the way you can interact and what you can say. That, that's what that's what makes people's perspectives slightly different, even if they parrot a whole bunch of shit that millions of other people say. Yeah. So it, so if you, so that, that, but that's, that's, so that's why I like, that's why I like complexity theory so much, because when you go to the emergent phenomenon that is a society, uh, a lot of these individual uh, philosophies get cashed out in very tangible dominant narratives and dominant action patterns that actually get manifested into laws, into customs. And, and so I, I think people, I, so I guess I was, I guess, I guess I'm, I've circled all the way back to what I was saying before, where it's like, I don't know, uh, uh, like when we when we start trying to think of like how much do we have to agree on, how much can we disagree on to still be able to functionally play a game together, let's say, as Peterson might say, it's not obvious to me how many different sets of base rules you can have trying to play the same game, right? Because like most games we play have very, like in business, right? It literally boils down to law. Like when you're doing commerce, you don't oh, get to... Uh, you cut off for a minute there. Oh, no worries. Like for instance, like for instance, we don't have a multicultural of business practices. Like when it comes to business, it's like you follow the law, the rule of law. You can't come into a business. I mean, you can certain jurisdictionally, but in most of the business of the WTO, you're not allowed to bring your own moral system into this game. It's like you negotiate a deal. Once you, you follow certain rules of law, things are made explicit, and that's the paradigm you operate with it. And it's understood that if some people believe that debts were optional and other people didn't, that's not going to be a functional game. But when we go to the cultural realm, some people are allowed to think that uh, I can just walk around thinking life has no purpose, and that's just as 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 valid a way to to view the world as life does have purpose. And we can still play all the same games together. They take it for granted that all these ideas can coexist. And and I think as we see the amount of turmoil right now that's happening in the world, we see exactly how much values, if values are contrary, how much of an effect that actually has. So um, okay, so, so um, so. Uh... I, I have a, a few questions and I, and I want to say something too. So uh, would you say then that this, uh, like what's been happening in more recent history of perhaps more multiculturalism is not beneficial for cultures? And also, um, like if people, if people have to like have these, these more, these more monolithic value structures and stuff like that then how can that how can that be the case if like jonathan height talks about people have uh, people have different values that they use to evaluate their culture and form their different moral frameworks so it's not like in that sense because we all come from our the particular upbringings and cultures that we're raised in it's pro like almost impossible 
for there to be one particular culture and value struck and moral value structure that everyone can uh, can agree on. Yeah. So this is where I'll step in with my humility, right? Um, um, so as long as we're willing, as long as we we have like as long when I talk about this issue, if somebody will concede um, to this basic narrative that I have that traditionally we kind of monotheist, monocultured or monotheist in our idea sets, and we did a lot of tyranny involved in that. Uh, and what I th and the, what I think has happened is the tree that was the monotheic idea, Christianity in the West, it got chopped down. And then when you chop down a tree, everything rushes to fill the void, right? It's like this huge, this huge idea niche system just got wiped out. And then so you have all these competing new species of ideas are popping up. And what you're seeing is now some trees are getting big again, like the social justice warrior tree, right? Um, um, what else kind of tree? Christianity is still a decent size. Let's say, let's say it was a dominant species in the forest and 80% of it got wiped out. So there's new trees popping up. So I don't know what idea sets the best going forward, you know? So this is where I'm, this is why I, I haven't really, that's why I don't really pothetize and, and say people should be Christians. Um, I haven't, yeah, you, I haven't did, you did the whole time we last, we did our last podcast. Well, that's because I was drunk. That's because I was drunk. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just own that. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's why I don't. I, that's why I have no memories of me ever doing that. Uh, um, because no, but to be fair, I mean, and I'm I'm happy to contradict myself, and I apologize if I was that declarative before. Um, but I, I mean, I'm willing to concede that going you forward, that, you said that everyone is Christian last time. Well, yeah, that's more like a descriptive. That's more a descriptive claim. Um, Even my mom doesn't believe that. <laughs> Yeah, that you have to buy into a lot of my epistemology to get there. That would take me a while to roll that one out. But, um, but I mean, to, to, to give a nod, to, to give to nod to the Brett Weinstein's or to the secular humanists, it's it's not obvious what which new because if you can if if I can see the monotheist the monoculture uh, era is over, and I think it is, and we're now in a multicultural era, um, even if I believe there needs to be a uniculture or that it's inevitable that it's, the uniculture will come out because that's just the most functional system. You know, China may or may not be able to prove that to the whatever extent that they keep that command and control structure of their society going, right? Like it could be the case that 100 years from now, it turns out that actually trying to enforce one culture in a very heavy handed way was the best solution. You know, that for all we know, that could be it. And it could be the case that we'll be sitting here in a little multicultural bubble going, hey, look, we're now this powerless minority, but we all have our own beliefs. Oh, dang it. China just raised the tariffs on the rump state that is North America after, you know, after the whatever, but, um, or North America. So it's like, I, I don't really know what the next phase is, you know, like if you're going real Christian, you'd probably start saying that like, there has to be like the second coming to unify things. I don't even know if you'd go there. So I don't know what the next, what the next solution is. And this is what I always end up saying to my brother. I'm just like, you know, you pick your secular humanist label. I'm going to mock it. Cause I don't think it's viable. I don't believe in secular, uh, secular, I don't think these systems kind of spread well, um, but it's 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 yeah, it's really not obvious what this what the environment's going to select for going forward. Um, so it's not obvious what solution you should offer towards it. I would just, I guess, as prescriptive as I, as I would get, I would just say that uh, I think we kind of figured out. But this is Peterson's point. I think we kind of figured out a core block of fundamental values, um, like the classical liberal values, more or less, like the rule of law, these basic procedural things. And I, I, I kind of wish we kind of could have our cake and eat it too and, and just kind of go back to some of those while still leaving space in the other realms, right? You know, like we don't play with these set of, of rules. We keep those, but we can, we play over here in this other sandbox in terms of like maybe how economic incentives we put up, but we don't negotiate on how the rule of law works. You know, we're not, we're not going to change that. We're not going to invent new courts inside universities. We're not going to change from innocent to proven guilty to preponderance of, of, of evidence. We're not going to conduct trials in public like we used to with witch trials. We're not, we're not going to yeah. do that. You know, like this, I, get, it's, I totally, I totally agree with all that. Yeah. So it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's difficult to kind of find these new balances, but I mean, I, you know, and, and maybe what's going to happen is conversations like the one we're having now and you know, what the, what the MMAs are doing and, and maybe there's going to be enough of these loose different collections of people who more or less agree on, let's say like classic Western values and maybe that loose confederation will, will end up being that 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 force that I thought earlier was going to take out the social justice war in the next couple of years. So maybe it's you know much to do about nothing. And let's hope that might be the case. But it's um, it's 
I, it's just it's a very novel way we're approaching very novel problems and it just it makes being a pro it makes making prophecy really hard to do nowadays so yeah <laughs> yeah 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 but I, I think you're right though that uh that seen those values of you know innocent and until proven guilty and all those classical liberal values seem like something that uh most people who who we even referenced in here like jordan peterson jonathan Haidt, thaddeus russell and everyone else seem to agree on that you should be innocent until proven guilty and we shouldn't have courts and universities and there shouldn't be public courts and all that kind of stuff yeah well it's it's going to be interesting because uh i don't know if uh patreon just banned banned Milo Yiannopoulos because he's associated with a hate group uh the apple ceo just came out and said we're going to start banning hate groups it's it's this thing is just right on the knife's edge because like uh because that's not that's not due process that's like it's it's like it's such legalese. Like I don't know. What's your opinion on this? Like the idea of free expression. It's like it's not just that the government's not supposed to take that away from us. It's supposed to be like a societal norm. You know, it's not just enough that we legally not do it. We need to believe it in spirit. Like, are you are you one of those people or? Well, you know I don't know. The, like this is a a really tricky thing because i'm I'm inclined to believe in the. I'm like basically inclined to be a a radical proponent of freedom of speech but at, at the same time i think companies should be able to make whatever whatever sort of decisions in that sense that they want to but then again like there's a pro i think there's also a problem with people getting banned just because people get offended by something that they say so i don't know because like the solution this one of it sounds like uh like i'm not sure what the solution would be other than government gaining control of these corporations or these corporations developing some sort of court or something themselves and i'm not sure which of those would be a better idea or if either of those are a good idea i'm not you sure go, you got to go the third way you got to have peep individuals saying I don't want to live in a world where corporations regulate speech. I don't like, we all have to like, I think that's literally where it has to start. It has to start with individuals. Like, um, like for instance, in, uh, in, in the, in the Bible, which I was reading recently, uh, uh, the, and I, I've actually historically, I know this is true. The, the Christians self segregated a lot and they really just focused on keeping their ideas very, very clear. Uh, and, and kind of, uh, the whole point was to not, uh, like you, you had to rep, you had to rep Christ, and if anybody told you not to rep Christ, you said no. You wouldn't participate in anything that didn't rep Christ. You just stuck to your ideas, right? So, and then by, and then one possible reading of history is well, this thing spread in two hundred years and took over the empire. So how did they do it? They didn't do it by putting together a coherent plan per se of 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 how you're going to execute a social policy to achieve a goal. They just controlled enough individuals that from the bottom up, it kind of it kind of rose up. And that's kind of what Peterson uh, basically says. Like Peterson's whole idea is that if I can get, if we can get uh, 50 million people in in the Western world to buy into my ideas, then the problem will fix itself. If there's 50 million people who believe in personal responsibility and free expression, and they don't, and they and they just act that way, that will that will that will they'll push to put the correct pressure on the corporations there'll be enough people who are productive in their jobs there'll be enough good role models for other people that's that's the idea of how it would be spread that's well, that's kind of that's that's his basic premise i think um, that uh, i think that some of his premise makes a lot of sense like uh like with in terms of responsibility for example it definitely is a problem that some people don't take enough responsibility but I think you can go to you can go too far to the opposite end of the spectrum and have this like fascist state where everything is about responsibility. And I know I, I understand this from my own personal experience because, like, uh, I'm a I'm a pretty I'm a I tend to I have a pretty strong tendency towards being a workaholic. So for someone like me advocating for more responsibility 
is actually the opposite of what I've had to do more recently. I've literally had to in like ironically enforce the it, like enforce discipline in myself to have to be less to be less disciplined and to focus on enjoying life more so I can work a reasonable amount but not get so crazy and obsessive that I'm stressing out about shit that shouldn't stress me out and still enjoy life. Yeah. Well, there's, there's always that yin and yang, you know, there's always yeah. that, there's always that paradox, you know, like, uh, and that's, and that's another thing that I, I, uh, I find kind of, I, I find some people have a hard time because if, if, if you are more of a creative open-minded type, which I assume you are right. It's, it's, I do find some of these more engineered brained people, they, they, um, not that there's anything wrong with that. They, they're very useful people, uh, very functional in a lot of ways. Right. But I, I find some of these times, sometimes these paradoxes, uh, kind of really get people down where it's like, it's not one thing or the other, you know, there's, there's not, you're not going to get a certainty there. Yeah. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's very, very hard to be prescriptive in this sense. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Okay. Well, I, um, I've been drinking a lot of water. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so probably got to take care of that. Um, but, uh, Hey brother, I'll just, I'll just end by saying like, uh, yeah, whether it's, the, whether it's the next video you make or whether, you, or if you find a particular interesting piece, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, maybe it's easier just kind of, if, especially if you want to have content, if you ever just want to nonchalantly just kind of riff on something for 20 minutes and just kind of pick a topic and go with it. Now that I think we have a little bit more of the, the same vocabulary. And I think if anybody's ever seen us, heard us talk once, um, they'll probably understand a lot of the nested assumptions. So we don't necessarily have to expand upon things as much because we're, we're kind of getting, kind of understanding what, what, what we mean when we say different things, because it, there's always that initial period of kind of constructing that, the mutual language, so to speak. Right. So, um, yeah, but it's been, it's been great talking to you. I'm really, I'm really, uh, uh, it's cool that you've heard of complexity theory. That's, that's my, uh, that's my, uh, favorite thing. Uh, or was my favorite thing. Now Christianity is kind of my favorite thing, but I still, I still, my first, my first love is complexity theory, but I just have no one to talk to it about. You know, if there was a complexity yeah. theory, complexity theory church, uh, I don't know. I, that might give Christianity run, run for its money for, uh, for a yeah. while, but I, I, I found one guy who really seemed to get it and I had a great conversation with him, but on left, he was like some sort of anarchist, uh, communist kind of persona. And he do like a lot of what I thought was virtue signaling. So it was, and Twitter's just the worst, right? So I had, I had a couple of great conversations. I'm like, oh my God, he's the first person who can actually talk about this. And he actually knew more about it than I did. And I'm like, oh, it's great. It's real life. And then I, one time too many, I think it was over the Palestinian issue. I kind of dug at him for virtue signaling. And he's like, you can't say that defending these poor defenseless Palestinians is virtue signaling. Oh, that's just, you've crossed the line. I got banned. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, well, thanks a lot, man. Yeah, I appreciated talking to you a lot too. This was, this was a, a much, this was a much more um, interesting conversation than the last one we had. Although I, I appreciated the last one we had a lot too. Like I, like uh, I, I think like you definitely enjoy just debating about things sometimes. But I think uh, uh, I kind of, I kind of prefer this more kind of conversational approach and nuanced view on a lot of different topics like we agreed and disagreed about some things but didn't get all like antagonistic which is exactly what I hope for and yeah for sure like I'm sure I'll talk to you many more times and even uh, it, it is a good idea just to do like a short a short video on one particular topic or something like that every once in a while because especially since uh, shorter videos are more likely to actually interest people sometimes than the the like three hour conversation that we had last time although i do appreciate i do enjoy having really long conversations regardless of what type of conversation it is but anyway yeah thanks a lot for talking man and uh yeah. um i'll just uh say all the things i like to say at the end of my videos here and then you can give any uh any plugs or any more last words or anything that you want to there um, so yeah, thanks everyone so much for watching another episode of the Mindgasms podcast. Hope you found this as interesting as, uh, I, and I think also Shane did and thanks everyone so much to, thanks so much to everyone who watches and shares 
and likes this video and subscribes to my channel and who contributes to me on Patreon. I really fucking appreciate it and it helps me out a lot. And, uh, and also, like I always say, I love you all. Keep being the tiny beam of light that shines through the almost impenetrable darkness in the universe. And importantly, always remember this, the funk cures all. <laughs> Keep having mind gasms and uh, any, uh, any plugs or any last words there, Shane? Um, I just want everybody listening to know that Jesus loves you. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. So cliche. No, I mean, um, uh, I would encourage anybody, um, maybe I'll just, uh, I'll make a comment on this video with my email, email address, but anybody wants to chat, um, that's probably the most productive thing you could do if you, if you happen to be interested in engaging with me. Um, yeah. And beyond that, um, yeah, everybody study more evolution. If you want to really understand how reality works, learn all the evolutionary theory you want. And that's, yes. uh, I, don't, I don't mean that in a condescending way. I'm just, uh, my personal opinion, I just think that if everybody kind of understood how evolution worked on ideas and on on um, culture and biology and that, how that interplayed, it'd be a lot easier to speak the same language when we talked about things. So that's my, yeah. that's my thought. Yeah, I totally agree. Awesome. Okay. All right. Good, brother. Have Thanks. a great night. Yeah, you too. Adios until next time, everyone. Have keep having mindgasms. <laughs>